Hello Raptors fans! Today I'm going to give an honest appraisal of the Toronto Raptors. I've been saying it for weeks now, but it remains pretty obvious to anyone who's been watching the games. The Raptors are mediocre, and they desperately need a capable center. I'll also be talking about the play of the Toronto Raptors bench, and in particular DeAndre Bembry, so let's jump in. The Toronto Raptors started the season at 2-8, and, and now they're 12-15. Obviously, that's better than how they started, but it's become rather obvious that the Raptors are mediocre. The Raptors have managed to figure out how to score, and have risen to number 8 in the league in terms of offensive efficiency, and a lot of that has to do with the improved play of Norman Powell and Pascal Siakam. Siakam has been far better as of late, and his all-around game, scoring, passing, and playing defense has made him arguably the most important Raptor. Powell's emergence in the starting lineup makes a lot of sense, as I've mentioned numerous times that Powell is by far a better play finisher than a play creator. Powell, when he came off the bench, was asked to start the plays, i.e. handle the ball in the pick and roll, create in ISO situations, and find other players in their spots. This clearly, clearly is not Powell's strength as a player. His strength is as a play finisher, a guy who can catch and shoot, and attack guys off the dribble when they close out on him. He gets to play that role in the starting lineup, as he gets to play off Lowry, Van Vliet, and Siakam, and has been on a really hot run as of late. Lowry and Van Vliet have been up and down in terms of offense, but when they're up, they're really up and carrying the team. All of this is kind of window dressing on the real problem which is that the Raptors have a gaping, gaping hole at the center position. Now, I said in an earlier episode that Aaron Baines was not as bad as his current production suggested. Well, I'm past this point now, and have resigned myself to the fact that Aaron Baines is no longer a starting caliber player for an NBA team. Without being too cruel, Baines has carved out an eight-year career in the NBA, playing for multiple teams and impressing fans with his energy, strength, and passion. At 34 years of age, it appears that he's nearing the end of his NBA career, and as a starter on a playoff hopeful team, he's being asked to do far too much. Fans can be pretty cruel when expectations fail to be met, and I think that that might be happening right now. Even I'm guilty of it. But as it stands, the simple truth is that the Raptors need to find an upgrade at the center position, and quickly if they want to make this season matter. But what about Chris Boucher? Chris Boucher is a statistically excellent player who is part of the Raptors' best lineups. The problem with Boucher is that I don't view him as a true center. He doesn't help with two of the biggest problems that the Raptors have as a team, post-defense and defensive rebounding. Boucher is an excellent weak side shot blocker who can come over and erase a shot with his sneaky athleticism and length. The problem is that with his thin frame, he's incapable of doing what true centers do on defense, which is to use their bodies to move players around. Centers, when contesting shots, will stand straight up and let offensive players run into them, forcing the offensive player to finish through contact or score around them. When a shot is missed, centers use their heft to clear the paint with a box out, bodying the opposing team's best offensive rebounder and keeping smaller players out of the paint. I like Boucher. I think he's a valuable part of the Raptors' rotation and deserves a lot of playing time, but he's not going to fix the Raptors' biggest issues. Paint protection and defensive rebounds are the biggest weakness for the Raptors. The Raptors are 28th in the league in defensive rebounding. The Raptors are also 28th in the league in fouling, meaning that they foul at an insane rate. Guess where the majority of fouls occur in the NBA? Inside the paint and this is likely a symptom of the Raptors lacking a paint protector. The Raptors are also 17th in the league in defense, which isn't the worst, but I think with the amount of good to great perimeter defenders on the Raptors, for example, Siakam, Van Vliet, Lowry, OG Ananobi, and the majority of their bench role players, having a 17th ranked defense is unacceptable. The fact that they are sub-mediocre defensively is a result of, you guessed it, bad rim protection. So how do the Raptors address this? Do they make a big trade in an attempt to bring in a guy that has a proven track record of providing what the Raptors are looking for? Or do they go small, attempting to find a guy who can fill their needs without breaking the bank? Let's start with the biggest rumor attached to the Raptors this season, Andre Drummond. 
There are big pros and cons when discussing Andre Drummond. Let's start with the pros. Defensive rebounding is one of the biggest issues with the team. Andre Drummond is arguably the best defensive rebounder in the league. He led the league in defensive rebounding percentage four times in his eight-year career, and is currently leading the league in that stat this season. He would instantly fix this problem for the Raptors. Number two, Drummond is a pretty young guy. Despite the fact that he was recently traded for peanuts and appears to be on the move again, Drummond is only 27 years old. If the Raptors wanted to sign him again this offseason, he would be a similar age to the rest of the Raptors' core. Number three, Drummond would contest way more shots at the rim than Aaron Baines. Drummond is a massive man who does a good job of getting between offensive players in the rim, and he would instantly give the Raptors a more fearsome paint protector than they have had thus far this season. Now to the cons. Number one, Drummond is paid $28.7 million this season, making a trade for him very difficult without gutting the team. Without trading one of Lowry, Siakam, Van Vliet, or OG, this is the best trade that I could come up with. Drummond is also an unrestricted free agent after this season, and Powell has a player option that I assume he's going to decline. Is this too steep, or something that the Raptors should actually consider? Number two, how big of an impact does Drummond actually make on winning basketball games? Despite being a career 12-point-per-game scorer, Drummond's effect on the offense seems to be negative. He clogs the paint and doesn't have many post moves, mostly scoring off of putbacks and lobs. Defensively, Drummond grades out as a good but not elite defender who drops on the pick-and-roll to cut off penetration, and does a decent job of helping. Will he be able to pick up the Raptors' complex defensive schemes or be able to switch as much as Coach Nurse would like? Well, that's another story. I think that the best argument for Drummond is that he would instantly make the Raptors a better rebounding team. On offense, he doesn't stretch the defense, but neither does Baines, and the Raptors have been getting by offensively with him in the lineup. The trade I suggested would probably be the best way of acquiring him without cutting into the core, but losing Powell would hurt the Raptors' offense. With Drummond out of the way, let's talk about the more budget options the Raptors could consider. Gorgi Jang is one such option. Jang has been in the league for eight seasons and has always been a good defender. He's a good defensive rebounder, a good pick and roll defender, a good rim protector, and can even shoot the three. He's playing behind Jonas Valanciunas in Memphis and is 31 years old, which is a bit too old to be part of Memphis's core. He is being paid $17 million a season, which means that the Raptors need to add a couple of players to the deal in order for it to work. I think Jeng would be a great fit on the Raptors, and a good target if the Raptors want to compete this season. Here's my suggested trade. Jeng is on the final year of his contract, meaning that the Grizzlies might want to cash in and get some prospects for him. This could be a deal that benefits both teams. Another player that the Raptors could consider is Derek Favors. Favors had a lot of hype entering the league and was one of the prospects the Nets gave up in order to trade for Darren Williams way back when. Well, he didn't pan out to be a star, but Favors is a pretty good defensive role player. Derek Favors is your meat and potatoes big man. He's a good defensive rebounder, a good defender, and probably wouldn't break the bank to acquire, as he's only playing 16 minutes a game behind Rudy Gobert in Utah. Here's a proposed trade. Obviously, Baines doesn't carry much value, even as a backup, and the Jazz are one of the best teams in the league and might not want to mess with their chemistry. Perhaps a future lottery protected first and a bench shooter would be enough to pry favors away? Well, that concludes the section regarding the Raptors' woes at center, and I wanted to end the episode by talking about the Raptors' bench. I've made comments that are critical of Nick Nurse's rotations, but I've always mentioned that I understand what Nick Nurse is trying to achieve. Nurse wants to run lineups that can execute his defensive schemes, and that means playing players physically and mentally capable of doing that. Stanley Johnson, Yuta Watanabe, and the emergent DeAndre Bembry are all players that fit the bill. 
I've discussed Stanley Johnson, Yuta Watanabe, and Chris Boucher in videos this season, but I haven't touched on Bembry. When the Raptors signed Bembry in the offseason, it was considered a reclamation project. I mentioned that while he was a multi-tool swingman who could do a bit of everything, his advanced stats were terrible and he couldn't shoot. Well, guess what? He can shoot now. Or at least he has been making his three-point shots thus far this season. He's only taken 14 shots so far, so let's not get too excited. I feel like a broken record right now, but the ability to shoot the three is such a difference maker when it comes to whether a player can stay on the floor or not. With a three-point shot, Bembry's high IQ plays and steady defense are big assets for a team that values those attributes. The Raptors have been on a bit of a Bembry kick recently, and have given him double-digit minutes every single game off the bench since receiving a DNP 10 games ago versus Milwaukee. Prior to that, Bembry had only received double-digit playing time once versus Indiana. Bembry does a lot of great things, defense being one of them. He's a ball hawk, always angling to grab errant passes or poke the ball out of players' hands. He's also got quick feet and is aggressive when guarding his man, invading their space, and he does a really good job of forcing offensive players to drive with their offhand. Bembry has also made some pretty fantastic passes this season, finding players in the paint and on the three-point line. Bembry always manages to have at least a couple of nice plays every time he's on the court, and it shows up in the stat line, where he's averaging almost four and a half assists per 36 minutes, which is great. The good news is that the Raptors have him signed to a bargain contract this season and next, meaning we'll be able to watch him grow as a player. And that's this week's episode. Did you like the proposed trades? Hate them? Let me know in the comments and on Twitter, where you can reach me at Raps Report. Please remember to subscribe and like the video if you enjoyed what you saw. Every little bit helps. And as always, thanks for watching Raptors Report, your source for in-depth Raptors content.